Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for our Livable Future Live virtual event series. Uh, my name is Kate Schwanhauser and I'll be your host this afternoon. Um, so today's event um, is called Carbon Capture and Storage Solution or Scam. So together we'll be diving more into this topic with the help of our guest speakers to learn more about what this technology claims to do, what it actually does, and the funding behind it. Um, but before we get to that, uh, we'll give people just another minute or so to get logged in. Um, and in the meantime, I have just a couple of quick housekeeping reminders and some upcoming event announcements that I'll share with you all. Um, and while I'm doing that, please um, take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, you can share your name and where you're joining us from today. Uh, so first up, just a couple quick Zoom reminders. Um, if you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, just click on the Show Captions button in your Zoom toolbar to turn those on. Uh, next, please feel free to use the chat box during the event as a space to share your thoughts and have a conversation with fellow attendees. We also have a few of our team in the chat this afternoon, so Kia will be sharing a few links with you as we go, and all her messages will have a blue dot at the beginning, so they'll be easier to keep track of those links. Um, and Phoebe will be helping to answer questions today as well. Um, speaking of questions, we will have some time for Q&A with our guest speakers at the end. So if you have questions specifically for our speakers, the best place for those is the Q&A box instead of the chat box, just so we can keep track of those uh, for that Q&A session at the end. And finally, I am recording this event and I will share the link to watch the recording with everybody later this week. So for those who are new to Food and Water Watch, um, today's event is part of our Livable Future Live monthly virtual event series. So every month we meet here and we cover a different environmental topic. So you can join us again next month um, in March for World Water Day. It's been nearly 13 years since water was declared a basic human right, but we still have a long way to go to ensure uh, water justice for all will share at this event how we can fight water privatization and stop uh, corporate misuse of public water resources to ensure that everyone has access to clean, affordable water. Then join us again in April to celebrate Earth Day. Uh, Earth Day is always an important time of the year to reflect on how far we've come, but also to set our sights on what still needs to be done. We'll have more details coming soon about our Earth Day celebration, so keep an eye out um, in your inbox for an invitation. Um, so as many of you know, Food and Water Watch is a national organization with over 2 million supporters, and together we are fighting for safe food, clean water, and a livable climate for all. Together we are building a grassroots movement that fights for change at the local, state, and national level to prioritize the health and well-being of our communities and our planet, not the interests of corporate profits. So today we are talking about carbon capture. And as I introduce our first speaker, I'm going to go ahead and open up a quick poll for you all. So you should see a box pop up um, where you can read the question and send in your answer about carbon capture and storage. Um, go ahead and fill that out now um, and we'll come back um, to the answers in a little bit. So, you know, why are we talking about carbon capture today? You know, in recent years, the oil and gas industry has been putting a lot of lobbying power behind carbon capture and storage proposals. And this year with potential new funding streams from the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, there are a number of new project proposals coming forward. But I think we should pause and consider something for a minute. You know, if the fossil fuel industry is pushing carbon capture and storage, shouldn't we immediately be just a little bit suspicious? Um, you know, I think we need to think, uh, stop and ask ourselves, you know, what is their motive for this? Spoiler alert, it's money. Um, the oil and gas industry stands to win massive financial gains through this greenwash technology. So this afternoon, we're going to look at this issue from both a national and a local level. And we'll hear first from my colleague, Jorge, who will give us um, the big picture about CCS and this money-making scheme. And then from there, we'll speak with my colleague, Emma Schmidt, and our special guest, um, Jane Klebb from Bold, Nebraska, about how CCS is impacting the Midwest. So please join me in welcoming Jorge. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Again, my name is Jorge Aguilar. I am the Southern Region Director for Food and Water Watch. And yeah, I'm proud to say I've been at the organization now for 15 years, uh, fighting for a livable climate. 
Uh, tonight, though, I am sad to talk to you about the rise of this new uh, deceptively shiny threat uh, called carbon capture and storage that we are starting to see uh, proposed in states around the country. Now, the term carbon capture and storage really refers to a set of technologies that seek to trap and sequester carbon dioxide. That's either from industrial facilities or from just the atmosphere at large. And proponents of it want to retrofit many facilities like coal or frac gas plants with this new technology so they can stay open longer. Supposedly, what they argue is that they'll be emitting less carbon dioxide. But next slide, but carbon capture is only becoming more popular recently, only because the energy industry and some officials are making it, are marketing it really, really hard. Uh, but carbon car capture is really meant to one, keep fossil fuel power plants open longer, and two, to ensure that we, the American public, agree to gift billions of dollars in taxpayer money to these corporations. So really what it is though, it's the fossil fuels industry's preferred alternative to actually investing in renewable energy like wind and solar. They wanna go that route. This is the fossil fuel industry. So now I really believe that concerned res residents like you tonight and millions like you have actually successfully convinced our elected leaders to mobilize resources to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of our climate crisis. But like snake oil salesmen, the energy industry really wants to take advantage of our climate anxiety, our economic anxiety, and sweet talk us into believing that carbon capture will magically eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. But the problem is that technology has failed for years. So quickly, let me walk you through a bit of the sales pitch the industry gives on carbon capture so that we can reach, and this is what they're really touting, 100% clean energy. So this pitch generally entails three steps, all of which have huge red flags associated with them in terms of safety and in terms of performance. First, carbon dioxide will separate from the other gases at the facility. Second, after the CO2, the carbon dioxide is compressed, it will be transported somewhere for storage. Usually that means specialized geological formations located far from the facilities themselves. And third, that the CO2, the carbon dioxide will be injected underground into these formations, typically into salt caverns or oil or gas fields. But the problem is that each of these steps actually has major, major problems. The first problem is that carbon capture actually requires huge amounts of new energy. Food and Water Watch did some analysis and found that if all the power plants use carbon capture, it would require burning 39% more natural gas and burning 43% more coal. So this would make us only more dependent on fossil fuels. Second, transporting the carbon itself would require a massive build out of pipelines. In fact, the 2021 White House report estimated a need for 65,000 additional miles of carbon pipelines in the US by 2050. So yes, 65,000. So Jane and Emma are actually gonna talk about the safety and property rights issues around these pipelines in a few minutes. But the final point I wanna make with underground storage is that it is unsafe. In fact, leaks and water contamination are a serious threat when injecting this underground. But I'll add, there's a big, big asterisk to this last point. And that is that before being stored, around 95% of captured carbon is actually used for pulling more oil from underground. So that carbon capture is used for pulling it from underground. So we didn't want to watch did another analysis and estimated that when that oil that's produced from the captured carbon is later burned, 
it emits 20% more carbon dioxide than the amount of captured carbon it originally took to produce that oil. So in fact, we get a net increase in carbon dioxide emissions. So you won't be surprised then to hear that the Bush administration, W, really kickstarted the carbon capture program even though plans for it have been around for decades. But I'll be fair, right? to be fair, it's a bipartisan effort that has funneled tens of billions of taxpayer dollars into failed projects around the country. And Food and Water Watch actually has an analysis of some we're gonna share in the chat here. They're uh, poster childs for what has gone wrong. But most of these projects in the US have been pilot programs that were either never built or were shut down completely shortly after being built because of underperformance, construction complications, and generally just a lack of economic viability. Nevertheless, the last two congressional bills, the Bipartisan Infrastructure, infrastructure Law in 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, intend to funnel billions in subsidies for these programs going forward. We've estimated that in the next decade, carbon capture programs like one called 45Q could, could cost taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars in the next decade. So it's just inconceivable, right, that hundreds of billions of these taxpayer dollars could be used for carbon capture programs, given that it has not worked and it will actually lock us into more fossil fuels and more CO2 emissions. Worse yet, uh, reports in the past couple of years of the programs have shown that the agencies overseeing this are really asleep at the wheel. Uh, one inspector general report in 2020, for instance, found that fossil fuel companies improperly claimed $1 billion in tax credits from that 45Q program I mentioned earlier. Another one, another agency report in 2021 found that the Department of Energy spent almost 300 million more than it planned to do for four facilities that were never built. That report it actually quotes, absent a congressional mechanism to provide greater oversight and accountability, the Department of Energy may risk expending significant taxpayer funds on carbon capture demonstrations that have little likelihood of success. And my final point here is, if industry execs actually do get their way, carbon capture will subject frontline communities to more pollution from the industry. So the, really the carbon capture supply chain will look a lot like the existing parasitic oil and natural gas supply chains which have already created public health and environmental disasters in the communities that live near them. So when power plants burn more fossil fuels, it means huge increases in air pollution that cause respiratory disease in the communities where they're located. We know that fracking operations leak toxic chemicals into our air, our water. We know that pipelines break. Uh, we know that injecting wells ca can cause earthquakes and the list of issues goes on and on and on. So we know these projects are often placed in majority minority areas, communities of color, low income areas. Uh, so expanding carbon capture would only burden our most vulnerable communities. And so we have to stop it. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Jane and Emma now to tell you more about what's already happening on the ground as there are a number of projects in Iowa and the Midwest moving forward, but if we can stop these, it will set a huge precedent on the national level, raising awareness about the money-making schemes um, and making it clear to the fossil fuel companies that they will face resistance, a disincentive for them to even try. But I wanna make sure you write your Congress members to ask them to oppose this build out of more CCS projects and handing really any more taxpayer money to energy executives. So yeah, I'm gonna put that in the chat and yeah, we'll turn it over to our other speakers. Awesome, thank you so much, Jorge. Um, 
if everyone you know thinks back to that poll question before Jorge began, the question about which of the following are problems posed by CCS, we know now from his presentation that the correct answer was all of the above. Um, those are all major flaws, uh, and I'm very impressed that almost 100% of people got that right. Um, so now that we have that background and that national perspective, we are going to zoom into the Midwest. Um, and these fights against CCS projects in the Midwest will set a precedent for future projects across the country. Um, and stopping those proposed projects is one of Food and Water Watch's priorities this year. Um, so I'm really glad that we are joined now by Emma Schmidt and Jane Kleb. Um, Emma is our senior organizer for Food and Water Watch and has been with the organization since 2018. She's a lifelong rural Iowan who became interested in organizing when the Dakota Access Pipeline was built through her community. And Jane is the founder and director of Bold Nebraska, which she founded in 2010 to mobilize farmers, ranchers, and native allies to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, she's previously served as the executive director of the Young Democrats of America, has led statewide campaign for healthcare reform, um, and all in all, she's an experienced grassroots organizer and political strategist, and she's an invaluable leader in the fight to protect Midwesterners from the threats that CCS poses. Um, so thank you both so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else at all. <laughs> that's true. That's true. We're both organizers. So we're, we love to be here. <laughs> awesome. And we've got a great group of people here who are ready to dig into this issue. Um, so Jane, I'm going to um, pose the first question for you. You know, the Midwest, as I've said, is where we're seeing oil and gas companies and agricultural interests really pushing this carbon capture scam in states like Nebraska, Minnesota, Illinois, the Dakotas, Iowa, there are nearly 4,000 miles of newly proposed pipelines. So can you just give um, the group today just a lay of the land of what we're facing in the Midwest? Yeah, so there's about three different carbon pipelines that are being proposed, Navigator, Summit, Tallgrass, and Wolf, so I guess four. And these are all coming at once. And as folks heard in Jorge's you know, presentation, you may be wondering why. Why all of a sudden are these pipelines being proposed? And we can give you lots of reasons and we will, but the main one is because of money. Um, even just last year, these carbon pipelines would have made on average $600 million in tax credits every year with the increase of the 45Q tax credit, which is what they would make money under, uh, unfortunately, under the IRA bill, which has lots of good stuff in it, but had this very bad part in it as well. Uh, these carbon pipelines will now make 1.2 billion. So that figure will show you that's per year, not over its lifetime of 12 to 25 years. So we're talking a lot of money for not a lot of government oversight. Uh, the federal government has been very clear that they don't have rules in place on carbon pipelines uh, in the way that they do for oil and gas pipelines. And if you don't think the federal government doesn't have the rules in place, you can imagine what's happening at the local level. So organizers like Emma and I are working across state lines to really uh, help other organizers go to county commission meetings, help trying to put proper zoning in place, simple things like setback and decommissioning rules. Uh, but we are under a major threat. And the Renewable Fuels Association, which is a group that normally is an ally to a lot of us in the Midwest, is now pushing a flat out lie to the public and the press saying that a law was passed at the federal government that says if ethanol plants don't lower their carbon scores with these carbon pipelines, the federal government's going to shut their doors in five years. So this is a typical big oil misinformation campaign to scare everybody uh, You know, looking over here while they rake in billions of tax dollars over here. Thank you for that overview. And Emma, you know, I think a similar situation is happening for you in Iowa. Could you give people a little more detail about um, the campaigns that you're working on? Absolutely. So like Jane mentioned, we have uh, here in Iowa, three proposed pipelines, Navigator, Summit, and Wolf. In total, they will cross if they are built, which we're not going to let them. But if they were, they would cross about a little over 1,500 miles of, of land throughout Iowa. Um, and we have seen a fierce resistance to, from landowners that are willing to actually sign over their land for these pipeline companies to use. In fact, I saw uh, Cindy here uh, is a century farm owner and she was in the chat. Um, she was one of our, well, she's my favorite landowner, absolutely. Um, but anyways, uh, and they have really put up a really strong fight here in Iowa. And in large part, that has allowed us to um, make some 
really great strides in stopping these pipelines. We've been able to have 44 counties, um, their supervisors have filed formal objections with, with the Iowa Utilities Board, which is the body that would ultimately decide um, if the pipeline can use eminent domain to take these people's land. Um, we have seen multiple bills in the legislature because of, of the fierce pushback um, the Iowans are, are taking to the state capitol building. In fact, we just saw five more, six more bills uh, introduced today on this very issue. Uh, we've also seen over 22 counties or 22 cities and towns file objections um, to these pipelines. And we've, we've created this very unique dynamic of coalitions. I mean, we're partnering with, um, for example, the, the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, we're partnering with different native groups. Um, and it's just kind of, kind of organizations or associations that we wouldn't normally make, but this issue, because it applies to such a broad spectrum of people from kind of every ideological background has created this really strong movement. And I think we'll be able to stop these pipelines, hopefully. Awesome. I mean, I, I have faith in your organizing strategy um, and with the support of everybody here. Um, Jane, I saw you on me. Did you have something that you wanted to add? All right. Um, so you both touched on this a little bit, um, but could you talk further about the impacts that these pipelines have on local residents? I've heard you mention, you know, property rights, and I know that there are also some really big health hazards that people should be aware of. You know, a landowner I was visiting with last week called me up because she had gotten her probably fifth packet uh, that she has already told the, you know, pipeline, I don't want this pipeline on my land. I have a lawyer. Um, you know, we have organized the landowners into these legal co-ops called easement action teams all across the Midwest. And but, you know, these pipeline companies are relentless and they use these tactics to try to essentially beat down and wear down landowners. And she, you know, told me it was just heartbreaking. She was like, I literally wake up in the morning thinking about the pipeline and go to bed thinking about the pipeline. Uh, this has now consumed the thousands of landowners that would be impacted all along the route. Um, it has completely disrupted their lives. They are living under the threat of eminent domain, only to be told by some elected officials who've already been bought and paid by these pipelines uh, or been told by the pipeline companies that they're being too emotional when they are using the words about being scared about eminent domain. Um, and so, you know, this is a playbook that these pipeline corporations and fossil fuel corporations use. They target black and brown communities in the South and rural white communities in the Midwest because they think we have no political power or they think that we'll support fossil fuels because of the majority party affiliation in uh, rural communities. And I think what you're seeing from Keystone, from Dapple, and now from these carbon pipelines is unlikely alliances coming together and saying, no, this is our property, this is our land, this is our water, uh, these are our communities that we want to protect. Um, and we're going to do everything we can to stop them. So there is a beautiful resistance, very reminiscent of probably early days uh, of organizing in the populist days of farmers pushing back on big corporations. Uh, a lot of those same similar realities are happening now. To hit on the health impacts you briefly mentioned, Kate, too, um, I think one of the, the biggest uh, places we can point to is Satarsha, Mississippi, where a carbon pipeline did rupture a few years back and it ended up sending 49 people to the hospital. Uh, and one of the, the big concerns is that we don't really know what the long-term effects of a mass gassing with carbon dioxide could be. What we've seen from Satarsha, I mean, beyond just the fact that carbon dioxide displaces oxygen and could lead to asphyxiation, um, if you don't die, you could have long-term brain injuries, respiratory issues. I mean, there's a whole host of, of health problems that could be associated with these pipelines. Um, and at the same time, there's all also a, a safety risk of just um, what we call man camps of, of bringing, you know, hundreds, thousands of out of state construction workers to communities where they don't necessarily have ties, where, you know, after after work, they're going to the bar and getting drunk or whatever, rather than home to their families. And we've seen in other pipeline projects that there, there are pipeline projects that there is an uptick in, in crime and violence and that sort of thing. So there's all, all these different issues that come into play um, that we might not necessarily think about even uh, with these pipelines and health and the safety of our communities. Great, thank you both for sharing that. Um, 
And, you know, I don't think it'll come as a surprise to anyone here today that the fossil fuel industry is really adept at lobbying on behalf of their own interests and their own financial gain. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen that play out with these pipelines? I can start uh, just what we've seen in Iowa. Uh, right now, the, the pipeline co corporations have 14 lobbyists at our state house. We have one. Uh, we, we can't quite compete with their billions of dollars. Uh, and last session, we saw them spend close to $100,000 lobbying to block our bills that would have banned carbon pipelines. So they are definitely throwing their money around. Um, for example, uh, Bruce Rastetter, who is behind the uh, Summit Carbon Pipeline Project, he has in his lifetime donated over $2 million to, to candidates and political causes to really just ensure that his own self-interest, his own businesses are, are protected. And that's exactly what we're continuing to see. He, he I don't wanna say he has bought and paid for our, our many of our legislators and elected officials, but in some sense he, he really has. And it makes it incredibly difficult uh, then for us to be able to see, um, you know, our goals of protecting the people of Iowa make it through the legislature when they're, you know, taking money from these players rather than uh, following the will of the people. And what's happening in Iowa is happening all across the Midwest. So not necessarily in Nebraska yet, we're in this unique spot that our state law does not allow our public utility commission like all the other states uh, do to regulate carbon pipelines. And so it's kind of quiet in Nebraska at the moment. We were, the same thing happened to us for Keystone too. It was like all then the energy got shifted to us after South Dakota uh, went through some of the other drama with them. So uh, in Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, and even in Minnesota and Illinois, uh, the pipeline companies are just hiring every lobbying firm they can um, in order to drown out the opposition. And this happens where we get so close to getting a good law. It might even get out of committee uh, and you think you have the votes on the floor and then a week later it all falls apart because the lobbyists get to enough people promising campaign checks or giving them campaign checks and feeding them a lot of misinformation. Um, this is happening in the state houses and it's happening at the county commission level. The only thing that we can do is constantly push back. So your voices really do matter. You know, contacting your state house or your state senator, contacting your federal representatives and really talking about how you're concerned about the risks and the health issues uh, and just the lack of real regulations around carbon pipelines that we should be putting a pause button um, before we're moving forward with building out 4,000 miles across the Midwest, 60,000 miles across the United States uh, in a very short time period. I wanted to add on really quick too, is that it's not just uh, money within the political realm too. They're like Summit, for example, is offer also offering uh, community scholarships. So your you know community group association can apply to receive twenty thousand dollars for any sort of project to just kind of really buy the the goodwill of community members. And we we saw that with Dakota Access as well. It's like Jane said, it's a playbook that they have, and it's really frustrating. But fortunately, we have a playbook of our own to combat it with. Yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned that there's 14 lobbyists um, to R1, um, but Jane, you mentioned, you know, that one of the most effective things we can do is really make our voices heard. And I think that is the strength that Food and Water Watch and Bold Nebraska and our allies bring is that we are, you know, on the ground, building people power, empowering local residents to stand up and fight back against these pipelines. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, how you've seen these movements continue to grow. And Emma, you just mentioned the playbook. Like, are there lessons that we've learned from previous pipeline fights that apply here that give us an edge um, in really taking this on and winning? You know, you know, I'll start and then Emma, I know you'll have lots of ideas. You know, the, the great thing about the lessons that we learned on all the previous pipeline fights over the past decade is we know that when we work together uh, in that when we support landowners and tribal nations, those directly at risk if a pipeline uh, is being built, that's when we win. So that means we all share uh, what's happening in our states, because we know if it's happening in, in Iowa or South Dakota, it's coming to North Dakota, Nebraska next. Um, we share best practices. 
We make sure that landowners are fully supported with a true legal team. So they're not just fighting it on their own with maybe their uh, lawyer who worked on their will, but they have a lawyer who works on eminent domain and who is going to the state houses as well and lobbying on behalf of the landowners. So really it's it's about a comprehensive campaign. And you know Emma has done a really good job in Iowa making sure that there's also actions, right? So if you're not directly impacted, you may be wondering, well, what can you do? In addition to, of course, contacting your elected officials, it's showing up at rallies, really having the backs of folks who are directly gonna be at risk of these carbon pipelines and calling this out for what it is, right? It is a climate scam. Um, and there are so many things that we could be doing to work on climate change and the climate crisis. And this is just handing a blank checkbook to big oil. I think you really nailed it. It is kind of a, a approaching it from all different angles. I mean, we're not just working in the legislature. We're not just working from a legal perspective. We're doing it all, um, which means we're working a lot, right? <laughs> but it's it, it's great because it's I've never seen a, a campaign that has such energy and passion and brings so many different people of different backgrounds together. So it's really exciting, if not exhausting. Um, but I was also going to add. One of the great events that they have in Nebraska is the Ponca Corn Harvest. Jane, why don't you tell us about that? Uh, I will say, if you ever go, I ripped my pants there. So uh, think about that. You can never embarrass yourself more than I did. You know, we find that the only way to like, not the only way, but one of the ways we beat all the oil, uh, the money that they have on their side is that we bring a lot of creativity to the fight and heart to the fight and storytelling. Um, so something that we do in Nebraska to honor the Ponca tribe, which is one of the kind of original farmers in our state is what I like to remind folks is that uh, we plant Ponca sacred corn uh, inside the Keystone XL route. Uh, this will actually be the 10th year. Now that the pipeline is rejected, it brings on a different kind of meaning for us to really honor and respect the work uh, that it was a 10 year fight to get there. But what that does, in, and they've replicated this model in other states, you know, you plant a cultural resource of a tribal nation inside the pipeline route, one as medicine for the land, and we do that intentionally with prayer, uh, with our unlikely alliances, but then that's a cultural resource that the pipeline company and the state regula regulation, uh, regulatory body, or if it's, you know, by the State Department or FERC, that they now have to account for. Um, so it's a legal strategy as well. And you can absolutely come to the Ponca corn planting. Uh, it's on April 29th or the harvest will be in the fall. You can get more information on Bull Nebraska. Awesome, that sounds like a great event. Um, so Emma, you mentioned a little bit about the state legislature in Iowa. And I know that this year we have a really big opportunity um, with some shakeups in the state legislature to make some real momentum on stopping these pipelines. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that and what's on the horizon for Food and Water Watch. Absolutely. So for folks that don't know, Iowa has a Republican trifecta. They have a super majority in our legislature. Our governor is Republican. And in some ways that has really worked in our, our favor on this issue because it means that eminent domain, which is kind of a, a central tenet of, of um, many Republicans ideology, uh, uh, they're taking this issue up. Um, like I mentioned earlier, just today, we've seen six bills introduced in the state house. We've seen uh, five in the state Senate and we actually, our um, top leadership and some of our senior uh, uh, representatives are introducing a bill later this week to take this issue on, which I mean is, is really great because it means that they're actually taking the concerns and the demands of their constituents seriously, which we did see to some extent last year, we had bills introduced, we had amendments and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, leadership stepped in and, and squashed it all, uh, which we didn't love, uh, actually didn't like it at all. And so what we ended up doing over the summer months and right before and into the November election was uh, ensuring that the uh, Republican Senate president who had helped stop our legislation the year before didn't get reelected and and because of the countless hours phone banking and door knocking and mailers and all everything that we put in because this guy supported pipelines he wasn't reelected we have a new senate president and that has given us uh, uh just different dynamics at the state capitol and made it much easier for us to hopefully be able to actually move this legislation i mean anything can happen 
it's a yo-yo up at the Capitol, but uh, I think we're feeling pretty positive in general that we'll be able to, to see legislation that will address this issue this session here in Iowa. And if we can stop it in Iowa, if we can, we can stop it everywhere else. I mean, if we can stop it in Nebraska or South Dakota, that stops it for every other state impacted. It's great to hear um, about all that momentum, which I know that we'll just continue to build in the coming um, weeks and months. Um, so that was a great transition. I do kind of want to zoom back out a little and come back to the national implications of these fights. So I'll have Jorge rejoin us um, and we can talk about that um, as a group. Um, but before that, I just want to check in, Emma or Jane, is there anything else that you want to share um, about what's happening in the Midwest with the crowd? I think just to reiterate what what a interesting interesting group of people that have come together on this issue. I mean, I'm an environmentalist at heart, and so normally I work with other environmentalists. And and at this point, I mean, we're working with people from all different backgrounds and ideologies, and it is just so great. And I think that this ability to come together will hopefully result in even greater change once we've defeated these pipelines. I do think that Emma, it's really good that you pointed that out because we learn so much from each other and we are sharing meals with each other, going to rallies together. You know, I was at a county commission meeting earlier and one of the commissioners made a joke saying, you will be able to identify Jane's minivan because it's the only one in the county that will have a Biden sticker on it. <laughs> and like, you know, I could have been offended as an organizer and rolled my eyes, but I laughed and said, probably true. Uh, I And then I went immediately to where we have common ground. You know, we have common ground in making sure that folks' property rights are protected and that anything that is built in our state and in our county uh, is safe. And this pipeline is another one of those things. And so, you know, it helps us, I think, show that we as folks who care about climate change and the environment care about our rural communities, care about our rural neighbors. Um, not That doesn't happen enough, I think, in the environmental and climate world. Um, and so we need to do more of that. That was great, thanks for sharing. Um, all right, so thanks for rejoining us, Jorge, um, as we talk more about the national implications of these pipeline fights. Um, so I'm actually going to direct the first question to you, Jorge, but others should feel free um, to jump in as well. Um, if you could just give us, you know, what will stopping these pipelines in the Midwest mean on a national scale? How is that going to um, help prevent other projects from cropping up around the country? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, one thing you can do no matter where you live is to really contact your elected officials and let them know you oppose these carbon capture projects. Um, we're going to reshare the website you can use to send that message. Uh, so it's going to go here in the chat here in a second. Um, but yeah, generally, um, there is not a lot of oversight, as I said earlier, or regulations for much of the infrastructure that uh, involves carbon capture, right? This is not something that there's been a huge public debate. It's not something that many people know about, even though it's been around a couple of decades. So we need to push at the federal level because it does also uh, impact what's going on at the state level. For instance, with these pipelines, there are not fully fleshed out federal rules on carbon pipelines. This just don't exist. In fact, we're waiting for these to come out potentially in October of 2024. Um, what we at Food and Water Watch are doing, at least this year, right, is continuing to really build up our national volunteer network. So that's like, no matter where you are, there are always ways to get engaged in advocating for a livable planet. Uh, so we're going to put a link right now too, where you can check out upcoming volunteer events. Uh, if you don't see a local event near you, the best way to get started is to just join one of our monthly central volunteer meetings to get plugged into national actions. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted to just ask Jane or Emma, do you have any thoughts on, you know, if we can stop these projects in the Midwest, is, is that going to deter this happening elsewhere? Is that going to decrease in interest from investors or change the way that these subsidies are working. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little more to that. 
I mean, I think when there are billions of dollars on the line, it, it's going to be tough, right? The, these these projects aren't just popping up in the Midwest right now, but this is kind of the central hub where where it, it seems, you know, we've got multiple crisscrossing pipelines. And I think that by rejecting them here in this land, like that Jane mentioned earlier, where they, they kind of seem to think that people are going to be on board just because we're, you know, tend to lean more conservative in our rural areas and more on board with these ideas by rejecting them here. We, we are sending a message to the industry at large saying, if it can't happen here, it's not gonna help it happen elsewhere. Um, so that alone will be really powerful, but I, I don't think this is gonna be a, a, you know the only fight we have on this issue by any means. You know, I think the government has bought into, both on the Republican and Democratic side, uh, the government has bought into the fact that carbon capture projects um, are, one of the ways that we're going to hit our climate goals. And I think that they've embraced them because they want to keep the oil and gas uh, folks at the table. And this is a way to keep the oil and gas folks at the table because they can pretend that they're lowering their carbon scores with these projects when really all it does is, is keep their manufacturing plants, their oil and gas plants open longer. Um, so on the one hand, we have to solve that real problem, right? We have to get both Republicans and Democrats and the federal government staff members to understand that the only way that we're going to solve climate change is actually pretty simple. There's no gonna, there's not gonna be a magic technology that's gonna save the planet. It means decommissioning oil and gas uh, projects while increasing clean energy projects, right? There is no other silver bullet. All the other things are kind of nibbling around the edges. So that's problem number one. Um, but the problem number two is actually stopping the infrastructure that will help, um, you know, extend the life and build out carbon capture uh, storage and injection of toxic waste into folks' land. So that's what we're currently fighting. And I think that's where citizens really have a direct impact. And sometimes people think, and we certainly heard it when we took on Keystone XL, Emma heard it when they took on DAPL, um, or all the other pipeline fighters that are in the chat that I've been seeing, you know, we're often told at the local level, why are you fighting a pipeline? They're just going to build it somewhere else. Well, we proved, I mean, the folks that, that fought the tar sands pipelines that were trying to crisscross the United States, we proved by stopping a couple of those stopped the expansion. If we would have not taken on Keystone XL, it would have meant that 10 tar sands pipelines would have been built across the United States. And it turns out that Line 3 and Dakota Access Pipeline were the last two tar sands pipelines that will ever be built in the United States because of the resistance in all of those fights. So, you know, my perspective is we try to stop the infrastructure that is going to hurt communities. And right now that means stopping these pipelines in the Midwest. Great, thank you. Um, we are going to take a couple of questions from the audience. We've been getting um, lots um, coming in in the chat and through the Q&A box um, and seeing lots of great discussions in the chat. Um, one that's come in from a couple people, um, are carbon capture pipelines under FERC? Do they get eminent domain? I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the FERC piece. That seems to be a common question. They're not under FERC's jurisdiction. Um, uh, they can technically be uh, if a pipeline like in Nebraska, they want to convert a gas pipeline to a liquid carbon pipeline. So they first have to get their gas pipeline decommissioned. Um, but the real issue is, is that carbon pipelines essentially are in this very gray area. Um, and that's what FIMSA is struggling with right now, the federal agency that governs kind of all pipelines. Um, and they're creating a rulemaking process for it. But, you know, there's some activists who think that FERC, that they prefer that FERC would be involved in it because there's a clear then regulatory path for every single landowner, citizen, and state to be engaged in. And others prefer kind of, you know, the local, the local and state agencies being engaged. From my perspective, I'm not waging that fight. <laughs> I want to make sure that there's rules in place at the county level, at the state level, and at the federal level. Uh, that are very clear and help level the playing field for landowners. And, you know, certainly one of those things would be ending the abuse of eminent domain for private gain, which a lot of conservatives join progressives in that perspective on these fights. Great, thank you. Um, 
Emma, this is a question for you. Someone is asking um, to hear your thoughts on disrupting in-person energy industry conferences where some of these false solutions are gaining traction. Hey, we've done that. Jane, remember back in November 9th? I remember it like it was three months ago. Uh, no, but I mean, I think what any any way that you can bring people together is is a huge gain to the cause, right? Uh, when, when we held an event outside the Carbon Capture Investors um, Conference here in Des Moines, Iowa, back in November, uh, we, we brought in folks from all sorts of different states and we brought in uh, the you know people that are invested because of, of climate change. We brought in people that are invested because of uh, their land uh, being potentially taken under eminent domain and, and brought them together. And, and that sort of thing is really what makes this movement strong. So so whatever it is, whatever reason you can find to bring people together on this issue, do it. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, another question is um, from someone who is working um, against carbon capture in the CARB plan here in California, and they want to continue their resistance. Um, is there any information you can share about pipeline plans in California? I don't know if maybe Emma or Jorge, um, Jane, you might know as well. I haven't heard of any pipelines being proposed in California. Um, not to say that there won't be. Right now, most of the carbon capture that's happening in California is on site. So a manufacturing plant, et cetera, is capturing it on site and storing it on site or turning it into a different product. Um, that's happening in states like Nebraska, where coal plants are capturing carbon and turning it into something called carbon black, uh, which is used for tires. Um, and so there's lots of environmental activists who support carbon capture to be turned into different product, but don't support pipelines and putting people at risk. Um, I think the most important thing to remember, especially in California, uh, is that you know there's a moratorium right now on building carbon pipelines in California. It's being proposed that that moratorium goes away. So I think that's the most important thing that folks in California can do is contact your state uh, House and Senate folks and let them know that you want the moratorium to stay in place until FIMSA has strong rules that the states and local counties can then follow. I want to add that California may be good good uh what's the word i'm looking for just sort of poster child for what's sort of happening and how things get rolled into what is well-meaning climate legislation so i think last year california actually passed the big package it was happening in, in state legislatures across the country big packages meant to reach what is clean energy right 100 percent clean energy and there's this slogan nearing happening with that particular term so in california big package passed but yes, yeah, sort of in the middle of that legislation is a lot of pro carbon capture uh, uh, language and potentially subsidies for that that will go. So it's not just happening at the federal level. This is at the state level where states are trying to welcome the industry, trying to give more money away. Because again, they're following this marketing uh, plug by the industry that this is what's going to save us. I think Jane said, right, there is no magic bullet. That is not the way to go. It's just going to further uh, make us dependent on fossil fuels. Great, thank you. Um, we've gotten another question. Um, is there any merit to using some of the same arguments we have used against fracking in the fight against carbon capture? Um, some of the folks on this call might know that Food and Water Watch was one of the first national organizations to call for a ban on fracking. And we have since successfully banned fracking um, in Maryland, New York, and a few other states. Um, so, Hori, I wonder if maybe you have some thoughts on, you know, how we could use similar um, arguments and language um, and tactics in this fight. Yeah, I think we're in the same place right now. It Fracking about 10 years ago was something that very few people knew about, right? It was a new unconventional way of, of drilling for oil, gas. Um, and right, Food and Water Watch was the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking altogether. And this was at a time when there were even some, some like the leaders, uh, a lot of them, a lot of environmental groups who thought that frack gas was one of these uh, bridge fuels that if we just sort of went with with it, you know, that's what would 
eventually get us to other renewables. And boy, right, was that wrong? Like we know frack gas is just as potent uh, a climate causing uh, problem as all the other fossil fuels. So we're in the sort of same place now uh, with carbon capture where there's like some sense, some uh, even in our own, I think, more environmentally friendly uh, circles of people who believe, okay, maybe this is a way, there's just some technology that's going to save us. And that isn't the case. So, you know, I think we are thinking a lot about what worked in sort of changing a, I mean, a majority of our supporters, a majority of the environmental community 10 years ago. And what we did is we mobilized, right? We did a lot of education. We passed local municipal um, resolutions and ordinances just found ways to put up resistance to the expansion of fracking from happening. And so that's, I think, what we're all sort of suggesting here to, this afternoon is to, yeah, right, look at your local, uh, what's going on locally, right? There might be projects in your own backyard or close to your backyard, but if there isn't, there's likely to be state legislation. And again, I mentioned, California, because that one has a trifecta of Democratic legislators, right? So it's not just Republican legislators in Iowa, it's Democratic legislators. I do work in Maryland, where we've seen a lot of this. But we were able to mobilize against fracking and pass uh, at least these two big fracking uh, prohibitions, one in New York, one in Maryland, that prohibited from ever happening. So these states didn't, never had it happen. So that's what we're sort of thinking is where we need to go next. Um, and really, it became really a, a position with, with fracking where, yeah, a lot of people just said we need to ban it. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago. And I think that's where we're at now, where we need to really stop carbon capture power taking place. And on top of that, though, there's this very uh, subsidy heavy argument to make about why like we shouldn't as taxpayers be following money there, but instead putting it into real renewables like solar and wind. Great, thank you, Jorge. Um, another question, um, this is about the Wolf Pipeline in Colorado. Um, would any of you be able to speak to the safety of burying that pipeline in the rock layers in Illinois and how likely is it that the liquid will stay there? I, I there really hasn't been any long term studies on on if carbon actually does stay underground from what I've seen. Uh, the, the one study that had actual statistics said that up to 10% of the carbon will leak out within 30 years. Um, and at the same time, when you're injecting something into the ground like carbon, you, you're raising risks like having earthquakes, just like we've seen in areas with um, heavy fracking. So it, there, there's your fracking uh, argument that we just talked about. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think none of this is proven except for in the sense that it has been proven to fail, right? We have seen over and over again in all of these pilot projects and demos that it doesn't work, that they're not capturing what they say they're capturing and, and they're not meeting their target goals and it's just a waste of money. And I think that's exactly what's gonna happen with the Wolf Pipeline. Uh, that's what's happening with um, the ADM's other pipeline in Illinois. They tout it as a success, but they've never met their, their targeted goals. So it's it's all of it's a fraud really. Great, thank you. Um, all right, um, and you know we are just in general getting a lot of similar questions from folks, and you know today we have an audience both from Iowa, Nebraska, uh, elsewhere in the Midwest, all across the country, and a lot of folks are just asking, you know, what can I do? How can I help? Uh, what's the best way for me to get involved? Um, so I know we've shared, you know, a few different ways already, but I wonder if everybody could just you know, maybe share your like key way that you want folks um, to know how they can get involved in these fights. You know, I'll start. I think one of the key ways is honestly talking about this on your social media. Um, I really think we need a lot of grassroots kind of friend to friend education, uh, very similar to how fracking and education on tar sands happen. Both of those things Fracking and tar sands were like unknown by the general public. It wasn't traditional oil. It wasn't traditional gas that people had 50 or 100 years to know about. And that's the same with this. And 
when people hear about this on the surface, they think it's a good idea, especially if they're a climate advocate. We're taking carbon out of the air. Uh, they think that's a plus. So we really have to start to explain that, no, this is just a big scam and go through all the talking points that we've you know, presented today. Food and Water Watch has a great page on it, Bold Nebraska, as well as the Pipeline Fighters Hub. Um, has a really good uh, kind of snapshot information about the risks of carbon pipelines and the scams that they are. But in addition to, of course, contacting your elected official and supporting landowners and all the things we've talked about, talk about this on your social media. Be one of the educators. I would uh, emphasize all of that. That was great. Uh, steal all my talk talking points and make me look like I'm not a good uh panelists. That's great. No, um, one thing I will say, if you're in Iowa, we are having an event at the Capitol on the 21st. Uh, so please join us. We want to try and get hundreds of people there. If you're not in Iowa, call me. I'll give you a piggyback ride. I'll bring my tandem bike along. We'll get there. Uh, we need as many people as possible at the Capitol. And the other thing that I'll mention, um, I can't, you know, not be here and mention it as a uh, organizer for Food and Water Watch. Uh, we would always appreciate your donations. Um, as you may know, we don't take any corporate funding, uh, but we also, if you didn't know this, don't take money from anybody that isn't a good looking, charming, brilliantly educated individual. Um, I know Cindy's on and she will tell you that I don't butter people up. I just tell the God's honest truth. And so I know that there's a lot of good looking, well-educated, charming, brilliant people on. And so even, even, 10, 20, $50 uh, would go a long way towards helping our fight against these billion dollar industries. Um, so if you can make a donation today, we would love it. Of course, um, if you can make a donation tomorrow, we'd also love that and the day after. Um, but we can put a link in the chat for you to do so. Or if you wanna just give us a text and get a link that way, um, you can text the word gift to 23321. Um, and we, as always, appreciate anybody that's able to do so. And uh, if you ever need a kidney, you can put me on the top of the list if you do uh, uh, sign up to do it today. I will give you my kidney. I have two of them. So first two takers. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. Um, and we'll also reshare the links in the chat. Um, Jorge shared this at the beginning. Um, there is a, a letter that you can send to your elected officials with some language about why they should oppose carbon capture and storage. So, you know, as Jane, as Emma, as Jorge have reiterated today, like the most important thing you can do is really contact your elected officials and make sure that they hear your voice. So we'll make sure that link is in the chat so that you can take a couple minutes um, later today um, to send them that message. Um, along with volunteering, um, Food and Water Watch um, has tons of volunteer opportunities available. Um, we would love to see you at some of our coming uh, meetings, whether they're virtual or in person, no matter where you are around the country. Um, all right, uh, we are coming up on the end of our time here. Um, so I am going to wrap us up um, on Q&A, um, but I want to thank everybody so much um, for sending in all your great questions um, and for the great conversation that's been happening in the chat um, throughout this last hour. This has just been a really great opportunity for um, us to all learn more um, and ways that we can get engaged. Um, so please, everybody, join me in the chat in thanking Jane and Emma and Jorge for being part of this conversation today. Um, Jane, we're especially grateful to you and Bold Nebraska for all of the amazing work that you're doing um, to help fight these pipelines. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and I will just say, I know we've seen a lot of interest in the chat um, for people to make sure that they get some of the resources and the links, the research that Jorge cited at the beginning. Um, so don't worry, um, we will be collecting all of those links, all of those resources, and I'll be sharing them out um, in a follow-up email along with the recording for today's event um, within the next couple of days. So just keep an eye on your inbox for all of that great material. Um, and finally, I just have a couple um, of final reminders before I let everybody go this afternoon. Um, so, you know, first, as you heard from Emma, Food and Water Watch's support comes from people like you. So if you can, I encourage you to make a donation today to help us ramp up our fight to stop CCS projects and protect our climate. Um, and then next, Livable Future Live, this virtual event series, um, happens every month. Um, so I encourage you to join us again in March. Uh, we'll be spending World Water Day, March 22nd, talking about our fights for water justice. And then in April, we will be celebrating Earth Day. So you can sign up 
um, for those events uh, in the link in the chat. Um, and finally, a little later this afternoon, you'll be receiving an email or text message asking you to submit feedback about today's event. So please leave a comment. Um, we really appreciate um, all of your feedback. And then later this week, as I said, I'll be sending out that recording along with all of the resources and links. And please do feel free to share that with family and friends who would be interested in learning more. As Jane said, that's one of the most important things we can do is just make sure as many people as possible know about the dangers of CCS. Um, so please feel free to share those widely. And that's all. Um, so thank you all again so much for joining us this afternoon for this important discussion. Um, I hope everyone has a great afternoon and that we'll see you next month.